So we're talking about limits today. Okay, the goal, you guys are gonna understand the whole concept of a limit, what it, the convergence, and also how to use limit notation. This is the foundation, the principle, the underlying backbone of calculus, okay? So make sure we take smart notes here because it's gonna be very important. This here, definitely write that down because that is how limit notation is represented. L-I-M, N with an arrow to infinity. Of course, that can change right there. U sub N equals L. That is written as the limit as n approaches infinity of u sub n equals l. So what does that mean? u sub n in this particular notation and setup represents the sequence like arithmetic and geometric, okay? And l is the number the function is approaching as n starts to approach infinity. So if you remember, n represented the, like your number of terms, right? So as your number of terms gets bigger and bigger and bigger, L represents the number that your sequence is getting closer and closer to as your number of terms continues to increase. So a limit is gonna converge if a sequence approaches a specific number, such as in like an infinite geometric sequence or series, because that's what we first learned about um, converging and diverging. And a limit is gonna diverge if it does not. That will happen if the number approaches infinity or negative infinity or it oscillates in between two numbers. And oscillates just means going back and forth between two numbers. So we're gonna take a look at that very quickly. And we're gonna determine if each sequence is convergent or divergent. If it is convergent, then we're gonna give the limit of the sequence in its proper notation. In other words, find the value of capital L. For A, I have 0 0.3, 0 0.33, 0 0.333, 0 0.3333. 0 .3333. Is this convergent or divergent? Convergent. It is convergent because this particular sequence is getting closer and closer and closer to what number? One third. One third or 0.3 repeating with that bar, but we don't write that. So we write it as the limit as n approaches infinity of this particular sequence is equal to one third. Capital L represents one third. What about B? Very much divergent. It diverges because what's happening to the sequence? It's getting multiplied by two. It's going to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger going to infinity. And when that happens, we cannot write it in limit notation because it doesn't approach a particular number. And we don't represent L as infinity. L represents a number, not infinity. What do I see? If it converges, what number does it converge to? One fourth? Yes. If you need to, yes, you could type this into your calculator and you can see that we have 0.2. Then 6 over 25 is like 0.223, I think. And then it continues to get closer and closer and closer to 0.25. So this one here, it does converge. And the values converging to is one fourth or 0.25. And last but not least, Negative one, one, negative one, one. What is that? Divergent. It is divergent. Anytime a sequence oscillates in between two numbers, like sine and cosine did, Ooh. it will never it, it actually approach a particular number, just go back and forth between those two numbers. So when a limit is that, or when a sequence is divergent, it will not have a limit, okay? Only when it's convergent because it's approaching a particular number. Keep that in your mind. As limits are, limits are what's happening as n is getting bigger, as n is approaching a particular value, it's getting closer to a specific number. How it works with functions is the same way, okay? Same setup, same notation, except the only difference is that we have a function now, not a sequence, okay? And then on top of that, we're looking kind of more specifically the limit as x approaches a particular value, like two or negative four, okay? So we're gonna be looking on the function and we're looking as x gets, becomes really, really close to that c value from either side of the function, it's gonna be getting really, really close to a fixed value l. So in other words, as x gets really close to this value of c, what is y getting close to? Okay, so L, it does represent a fixed value. More specifically, it represents the Y value 
of that function as you get really, really close to x. Now, depending on the function, f of x might not come close to a particular value. It might go to infinity. Or maybe on one side, it'll come to one number, on one side, it'll come to another number. In those types of situations, the limit does not exist. Okay? So even with functions, there's going to be a situation where you're not going to have a limit, and those would be those types of situations. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at some examples here. I am going to walk you through how to see this using your calculator, and then I'll show you an algebraic way to do this as well. Is there always an algebraic way to find the limit of a function? Yes, but depending on how complex that function is, it's going to determine whether or not it's going to be on a calculator section or a non-calculator section. So I'm going to show you how to do it both ways, okay? Now the first one is going to be very simple. Okay, of course, I got to baby step you into this, but realize that this is all a part of your introduction into calculus, okay? It may be a little tough, maybe a little bit abstract, but you have to cross those burning sands into calculus land. Here we go. Find the limit or state that the limit does not exist. I have, I think, four functions, five. The other ones are just on other pages. So the first one, I have the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared. What I'm going to do is we're going to look at this on a calculator, OK? So go ahead and get your calculators out. Go into your y equals, and let's graph x squared. Go ahead and take it back to a standard window, because I don't know what you do with your calculator. So zoom 6, and there it is. Beautiful x squared, ain't changed, it's still the same. Okay, so to determine that fixed value that the limit as x approaches two is going to be, we have to look at the graph and say, okay, x, I think it'd be better if I do it as a, as a sketch. Okay, when x is two, this is the point on the graph when x is two. So this notation is basically saying, as x approaches 2 from the left and from the right, it's getting closer and closer on both sides to a particular value. What value do you think that is? If you're unsure, what we can do is we can look at our table. And we can plug in some values that are really, really close to two to see what number is slowly approaching. In order to do this, we gotta change some settings though. So everyone, press the second button, press the window button. Second window takes you to your table setup. Now right now, it's gonna automatically populate the numbers, but what we wanna do is we wanna go down to independent, we wanna enter and highlight ask. So now when we highlight ask and we go to second, graph, second button in the graph button, we can type in our own x values, such as 1.9. That's pretty close to 2, is it not? So it's 1.99. So it's 1.999. So it's 1.9999. When I look, this number looks like it's getting really, really close to what number? 4. That right there, by plugging in 1.9, 1.99, 1.999, that's coming from the left-hand side, this left arrow. If I was coming from the right-hand side, I would type in numbers that are really close to 2, such as 2.1, 2.01, 2 2.001, And we can see, even from the other side, it's getting really, really close to Four. Since it's approaching the same value from both sides, the limit does exist, and the value is going to equal four. If you're thinking something, hold on to that, okay? Because remember, I said I was going to show you how to do it graphically, and now I'll show you how to do it algebraically, okay? Let's look at this next one. The limit as x approaches 1. 
of x squared minus 1 all over x minus 1. We're going to look at that graph as well. Okay? So, yeah. I go back to my y equals. I am going to type in that function. Remember, alpha, y equals, and enter. We'll pop up that fraction feature for you. x squared minus 1 all over x minus 1. There's that function. So I'm looking at the limit as x approaches 1 on this function. So there's my graph. Uh, did it go through 0, 0? I forgot just that quickly. Was it above? Yes. So this is a rough sketch of that graph. I'm trying to figure out, as x approaches 1 along the graph, that point right there from the left and the right, what number is it getting really, really close to? So remember, I can go into my calculator. And since I've already changed my setting to ask, I can go back to the table and start asking it some values that are really, really close to 1, like 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999. What numbers are getting really, really close to? 2. Let's check. Let's go the other way. 1.1, 1.01, 1.001. Do you agree that is getting closer to two? So the limit as x approaches one of this function is equal to two. Now C, you gotta add that little part in there. What type of function is that? It's a piecewise. And you know good well your graph can't, your graph can't do piecewise, so you kind of got to know a little bit of a old school graph in here, OK? Remember, f of x is the same thing as saying y. And a piecewise function, a piecewise function is basically different types of functions that combine together to get you one entire function. So we basically have y equals 1 and y equals negative 1 for these respective intervals. Now, real quick, what does y equal 1 look like? It's a straight line. Give me a little bit more. Kind of straight. Horizontal line that's parallel to the x-axis that crosses the y-axis at 1. And because it says for all the x values that are greater than or equal to 0, I'm going to have a closed circle at 1, and it's going to be a horizontal line that points to the right. This is the top part of the piecewise function, that y equal 1. But that second piece, the y equals negative 1, well, go ahead. It's different. It's different? Like, what do you mean? What does it look like? Below the x-axis. Below the x-axis at negative 1. And it's got an open circle. It has an open circle. And it goes to the left. And it goes to the left. This is what this function looks like. I wouldn't get that particular graph if I tried to graph it. It would give me one horizontal line at 1, one horizontal line at negative 1. Then we would have to recognize that we have to split it up. But look at the limit. As x approaches 0, from the left, and from the right. Does it approach the same number like how I did in A and B? No. It approaches two different numbers. In order for a limit to exist, they have to approach the same value. So this is an example in C of where the limit 
does not exist. They have to approach the same value from the left and the right hand side in order for the limit to exist. And this is how we can find limits algebraically. All right, let's look at this one. It's another piecewise function just to make sure that we understand and also kind of to practice a little bit, okay? I don't know when's the next time you guys will run across another piecewise function, but I also think we actually taking this out of pre-cal too, so. We're gonna be looking at the limit as x approaches two of f of x. The first one is y equals x plus three. It's also a great time to review how to graph different functions. Y equals x plus three. That is a line that has a y-intercept at three and a slope of one. So I'm just gonna very lightly kind of trace it out because remember, I'm only concerned about the values that are greater than or equal to two. So zero, three, up one, over one, up one, over one, up one, over one. This is my line for x plus three, but I'm only concerned about the x values that are greater than or equal to two. So from this point and everything greater, that's what I'm concerned about. But that other one, y equals negative x minus two. What's my y-intercept? Negative two. Then I go down one over one, down one over one, down one over one. I do have multiple y's because here is an open circle at two and it's going down. Oh, no, no, it's down, no, never mind. It's actually not going down. It's all the values that are less than two. So I'm actually going this way. But like you said, Logan, as I approach two from the left and two from the right, I'm on different pieces of the piecewise function. And they don't approach the same value. So the limit does not exist. Again, I'm looking at these graphs because this way, because on a graphic calculator, it would not give me the pieces that I needed, but actually show two lines that are intersecting with each other. Try this one. Remember, if you're unsure what it looks like, you can always graph it. And then tell me what the limit is as x approaches zero, if it even exists at all. The limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x. When you graph this, you have to be in what mode? Radian. Put it in radian mode and see what the graph looks like. Now. What did you get? One. So it does exist. Very good. It should have been a nice little like a kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So you look as it gets closer and closer to zero, it was getting closer to one. Good stuff. Now, of course, this is graphically that you can do this. Every single one of these could have been done algebraically, okay? So I wanna show you how to do it algebraically in pink. One way that you can determine the limit as x approaches a particular number of a function is simply by plugging it in. Like if I plugged in two in for x, into this function, what's two squared? Four. Four. That was what the limit was. Yeah, but it did something. Huh? It, like it, when you plug it in, like there is no spot where it doesn't equal anything. True. So the limit is always going to exist on, on, on a quadratic. But not every function is like that. But it's just. Hmm. I don't know. I don't get it. But that's the thing, when you plug in that particular value, that is the number, that's that fixed value that you're getting closer and closer to as you're getting closer to x, 
I mean, as, you, as x is getting closer to 2. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense how you're supposed to get it. Just don't, yeah. Very much so. All right, you can do the same thing here, OK? You can try to plug in the value. But when I plug in 1, 1 squared minus 1 all over 1 minus 1, what do I get? 0 over 0. When that happens, that doesn't mean it's undefined. Whenever you get 0 over 0, that just means that you probably have to do some algebraic manipulation to that function and then try to plug in again. Like when I look at x squared minus 1, can I do something with that? Like do some type of algebraic manipulation? To, yeah. Like what? Minus 1, yeah. I can factor it. And since it's x plus 1 times x minus 1 all over x minus 1, what happens? You can cancel out the x. I can cancel out the x minus 1, so then I'm just left with x plus 1. Now when I plug in 1 here, I get 2. If you recall from your rational functions, when things cancel out, that means you have a hole. There's a hole that's occurring right there at that orange point. So at 1, technically, is not does not exist, but as the limit approaches one, it's approaching two. It's getting closer and closer, closer to two. Here, we algebraically, automatically, these weren't going to exist because remember, these answers, the four and the two, these are the y values as you're getting closer and closer and closer, or as x is getting closer and closer to a particular number. Here, we're already told what the y values were y was equal to 1 and y was equal to negative 1. So automatically, c wasn't going to exist no way. Look at this one. Two different pieces of this piecewise function. If I plug in 2 to the first piece, what value is that? And when I plug in 2 to this piece, what's that value? Again, they're not the same value. So that we knew that one was not going to exist. Now this bad boy, when you plug in zero, trig, what's the sign of zero? It's zero. What? You have another zero over zero situation. But to simplify this, we ain't there yet. <laughs> so we'll come back to that. But trust me, you can simplify this so that way you could get one algebraically. But we're not there yet. So all of these could have been done algebraically. Easiest way, plug in. If you get 0 over 0, that means you can simplify it and then try to plug in again. So you can find the limit algebraically or graphically, just depending on if the problem's calculator or not calculator. Questions? So, um, like I said, Sometimes algebraic manipulation is going to be needed in order for you to evaluate limits of functions algebraically instead of graphically or using the table. Such as this. I have the limit as x approaches infinity. Now, you know good and well, if I plug infinity into that, I got an x on the top and an x on the bottom. I, that's not feasible. But what I can do is I can separate the numerator into two fractions like so. What's 5x over 5x? Five it's 5. And then 3 over x is just going to stay 3 over x. Now, if I plug in infinity, a really, really, really big number into x, what happens to this fraction? It's really small. It's close to what number? No, not one. It gets really close to zero. Like three over a million is point zero 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 in some number, right? So basically, when you plug in by doing a little bit of algebraic manipulation, and then when you actually plug in infinity or a really big number, this is basically approaching zero. So 5 minus 0 is 
five. So the limit as x approaches infinity of that function is going to be five. That's how you do it algebraically. Graphically, this is a rational function where there is a horizontal asymptote at five. So this graph, as x is approaching infinity, is getting closer and closer and closer to five as x is getting really, really, really thick. That's what it looks like visually. Algebraically, this is also how you show that a horizontal asymptote is what it is as well. You use limit notation. What do you mean? So if you recall back from last year when I had you guys do rational functions, I never asked you to, sh to show why the horizontal asymptote was what it was. I, I only said, look at the uh, degrees of the numerator and denominator, and if they're the same, it's the coefficient. Well, the reason why is because of this. As x gets really, really, really large, your value is going to start to approach a particular number. That particular number is your horizontal asymptote. Because we hadn't gotten to this point, I left that part out. But now that we're here, if you get a problem that says show that the horizontal asymptote is five of this function, you will use limit notation and do exactly what we, I showed you here. Okay? Because again, the graph is going to tell you what's happening. It's going to start to curve and get really close to that horizontal asymptote. So that's how you can find the algebra. Again, the limit as p approaches zero of that function right there, I can just plug in. When I plug in zero, I'll get 3x squared. And that's it, right? Because oh. it'll be minus 4 times 0 times x plus 0 squared, because it's as p approaches zero. So this goes away, this goes away, and I'm just left with 3x squared. What about C? The limit as H approaches zero of all of that. It's going to be something over zero. Well, let's see if I plug in zero for H, it's going to give me X squared minus six. X squared minus six. And then a negative X squared. Plus six. All over zero. Zero over zero. And whenever you see zero over zero, that means you can manipulate it. How about FOIL x plus h squared? x squared plus 2xh plus 2h squared. Yeah. Minus 6. Then I have a minus x squared plus 6 all over h. What I'm doing right now is I am manipulating the top. I'm expanding it. What happens now? I can cross out the sixes and what else? The x squared. So then I'm left with this. I can show enough factor out an h. And you do. You want yeah, to. Because it's zero. Because right now it's still zero over zero. Oh. So I have the limit as h approaches zero of 2x plus h once I cancel out that h. When I plug in zero now, what do I get? 2x. So the limit as h approaches zero of that entire function is equal to 2x. Questions on the algebraic manipulation part to find limits. So, how does this all tie in? How does this all tie in? I'm going to skip over these few. These are just some extra practice problems, but I think, do you guys have the hang of it? We're Evaluating, plugging in. If you get zero over zero, you have to continue to manipulate, manipulate by factoring or foiling. Okay? So like I said, we're going to take this idea and we're going to apply it to the fundamental principle of calculus. Now, real quick, you don't have to write down anything on the slide, but I'm going to ask you. If you were asked to find the slope of this line, how would you do it? 
three of them before it. How'd you, how, how do you know? Like what? It's rise over run, right? That's what you learned a long time ago. That's what slope is. If I gave you two points right here, How would you find the slope? Uh, y2 over minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Old school formula slope, right? But to find the slope of a curve, That's the there's one. infinitely many of those. Mm. But to do that, you take the concept of old school slope and the concept of limits, you put them together. Okay? To find the slope of curves. All those lines that were on the previous slide, they were called tangent lines, okay? Tangent lines touch a curve at one particular point, as you can see, A, B, and C, touch at one particular point, okay? By finding the slope of those tangent lines, you are basically finding the slope of the curve at those respective points. There's no way to find the slope, one slope for a curve, okay? There's infinitely many points on a curve, which means there's infinitely many slopes for a curve. And since we can't really find every single possible slope on a curve, because you know, depending on the function, it could be negative infinity to positive infinity, so infinitely many. We can find a rule or an equation that gives us the ability to find the slope at any one of those points. The slope, or the proper IB term, gradient, of the tangent line is a measure of how fast y is changing as x changes. So together, slope and limits gives you this formula here. Slope and limits merged together give you that formula that I boxed in pink. And this is called your formal definition It also can be called the difference quotient. And it's also called the first principle of calculus. This formula is also in your reference book. Um, no, no, you don't. Just the one in the pink, but I'm going to show you how it ties in together. Okay. So what does this mean? This essentially means is that, and, and I want to use the, the, the graph down at the bottom and the first part. Okay. When you have a curve, f of x is the same curve on every single picture. Right. <laughs> Long time ago, geometry, you were able to find the slope of this line right? Rise over run, y2, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, okay? But on a particular function, this point is x and f of x. This point over here is x plus h, f of x plus h, because I'm, I'm a certain distance away from the original point of x. But as h gets smaller and smaller and smaller, closer to zero, you eventually take a line that's originally a secant and you turn it into a tangent. This formula, this formal definition, this difference quotient, this first principle of calculus allows you to find the slope of this tangent line at this respective point. It helps you find the gradient of this curve at that one particular point. This formula allows you to find the gradient 
of the tangent line, aka the gradient of the curve at that particular point. So how do you find the slope of a curve? You use that formula and it will give you a general rule to find the slope at any point along that curve. Let's do that. We're gonna take the concept of a limit and old school slope merge together to do that here, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the rule for f of x equals x squared plus one. Then we're gonna find the exact slope of the curve of that function at the point where x equals zero and x equals one. So to find this rule that will help us find the slope of the curve at any point, we need to apply the limit process. Now I'm gonna write it down again, the formula here, because I don't have the formula on the same piece of paper that you guys do, okay? So the formula is the limit as h approaches zero, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Now very quickly, when you see f of x plus h, what does that mean? It's your y value plus the value of h, right? Mm -hmm. No, no. It's the y value of x plus h. True. So that means that x plus h becomes? Mark. Plug. I have to plug it in. It's the same concept. If you saw f of three, what would you do? Plug in three, four, x. So when you see f of x plus h, that means you plug in x plus h into x of your function. Okay. And that's usually that part right there is what trips up students from the beginning. They're like, I don't get formal definition. I just want to make sure everybody understands that f of x plus h just means I'm plugging in x plus h in for every x that I see in my function. So I'm going to change colors to make sure everybody understands this. So since it's x squared plus 1, everywhere I see an x, I'm going to put an x plus h. So that becomes x plus h squared plus 1. And that right there in the red represents the part that I've highlighted in red. So again, everywhere I see an x in my function, I'm going to replace it with the x plus h. I still pull down the whole function. Just like here, if it was f of 3, I will plug 3 in for x, and I will still have the square and the minus 1. Same concept. Now I need to subtract f of x. Well, f of x is the original function. So I'm going to do minus x squared plus 1. There's a reason why I put that in parentheses. Say it again. I need to distribute. But all this is over h before I do any of that. Now, if I try to evaluate the limit at this point, if I plug in 0 for h, I would get 0 over 0. Because my h's will go away. I'll have 0 on the bottom. And then I have x squared plus 1 minus x squared minus 1. Everything will cancel out 0 over 0. So that means I can manipulate my numerator. So the limit as h approaches 0, let's expand x plus h squared. I'm going to have that plus 1. Distribute that negative. I can, because if I try to plug in 0 again for h, I'm still going to have 0 over 0. Can't have that. I need to continue to simplify until I get to the point where when I plug in 0 for h, I no longer have 0 over 0. So what cancels out? The x squares and the And the 1. So then I'm just left with 2xh plus h squared over h. Oh, you can split that up. You can split that up. I mean, it gets the same thing. Or you factor it out. And I'm showing the factoring out method just in case you have to show 
this process. They look specifically for the factoring out of H. That's always a method point in there. So don't, don't skip that out. Yes, you can cancel out H because the H is in every term, but you do that because you can factor out an H. Yeah. Now that I can do that, okay, I'm gonna, mm, I shouldn't have went that far, I'm sorry. All right, so then I'm gonna swing down here. The limit as H approaches zero is two X plus H. Now when I plug in zero for H, my H goes away and I'm left with 2X. So 2X is the rule that will help me find the slope of this particular curve, X squared plus one, at any point. So you would plug in the zero Yep. So now that I have my rule, I can plug in zero for X and one for X to find the slope of the curve, AKA the slope of those tangent lines at those two respective points. So when X equals one, my slope is two. And when X equals zero, sorry, I put them backwards, so I wrote one first. My slope is zero. Write it like that. Mm -hmm. So again, by using the formal definition, I'm able to find the general rule of 2x that will help me find the slope of the curve, which is basically the slope of the tangent line at any point. Specifically, we wanted 0 and 1, so we plugged in those 2x values into the rule to get the two respective slopes. Now, visually, I have this up here because I just want to make sure that you guys understand this. Here's the function x squared plus 1. It is a quadratic where the uh, vertex is at 0, 1. And as you can see, here's the point where x is equal to 1 on the original graph. And here is the tangent line. We found the slope of the curve at 1 to be 2 which was the slope of the tangent line. And if you look, I go up, one, up two over one, there's that slope of two. You found it, found it well. At zero, here's that point. Here's the tangent line. It's horizontal, which means it has a slope of zero. We found that out. Again, using the rule, we're able to find the slope of the curve at any point which is the same thing as saying the slope of the tangent line at that respective point. That's what we found by using the formal definition and plugging in. Questions? This is that fundamental principle of calculus. That hurts someone. Okay. <laughs> so, we're able to derive enough. So, like I said, we're able to derive this function when we use the limit process. Again, this function will help us find the slope at any point on that function. So, when you find that rule, you are finding the slope of the curve at that respective point, aka, you're finding the slope or the gradient of the tangent line. That rule, that derived function that you get when you use the formal definition is called the derivative. Okay? It is called the derivative when you use that formal definition to get that rule. The notation for the derivative, a lot of times you'll see f prime of x. That's how it's read. It's a little apostrophe. Not to be, to be confused with complement, because I'm dealing with a function here, not like a set. Was that 2x we got the derivative? Exactly. When we found that 2x in the last problem, we found the derivative. The process of finding the derivative is called differentiation. So the problem ever says differentiate a function, they want you to find the derivative. So the rule is the derivative. The rule that you come up with is called the derivative. 
and the derivative is the formula for instantaneous rate of change of a function. Not average rate of change, which is old school slope. Old school slope is average rate of change, but instantaneous rate of change is the derivative. Because it's at that, that instant, that exact point. Did everybody get that? These are some other notations um, for the derivative. Uh, I don't know what happened to all my symbols. So let's say the original function was given to you as y equals. You can use y prime to represent the derivative, or you can use dy over dx. Those also mean the derivative instead of f prime of x. This notation as well could be used. So let's say if you were given f of x equals some function, d over dx of f of x is another notation to represent the derivative. So these are the different ways that you can see the derivative along with f prime of x. All of these mean the same thing. Find the derivative. Use the formal definition. Find the derivative. Okay? Like I slid that in there? Slide that in there. Baby steps. Remember, burning fans. So we're going to do the same thing, just to practice, okay? Um, and then I want to give you, well, depending on how, we're probably going to give, probably this, this be the last one. I want to give you uh, three to practice for homework, okay? So just using the formal definition so you can get comfortable with it. So we're going to use the difference quotient, aka the formal definition, the first principles of calculus. They all mean the same thing to find the derivative of f of x equals x squared minus x plus 2. And then we're going to find the gradient of the tangent line at x equals 1. So remember, this is the formula. I'm just writing this down. In this case, if I lose anybody. So that first part, I'm plugging in x plus h for every x of the function. This function has two x's. So I have to plug in x plus h twice. So it's the limit as h approaches zero of x plus h squared minus x plus h plus two. That's just the first part. Then I have to subtract my function, just the original function, how it is. All of that is over h. Now, of course, we tried to evaluate the limit here. We'll get 0 over 0, so we are going to have to keep going. We already know what x plus h squared is. We did it in the last problem, and a few problems a couple of slides back. That's x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Then I need to distribute that negative. So I'll get negative x minus h. Bring down the 2 and distribute over that negative to get negative x squared plus x minus 2. All of this is over h. What do you see? I can cancel out the x squares, I can cancel out the x's, and I can cancel out the, the 2. If you use the formal definition correctly, all of your non-h terms should cancel out. If you notice, once we got to this line, the last problem, there were no terms that didn't have an H in it. That should be the case all the time. If you end up with some random constant or a random variable, you messed up somewhere a few steps back, okay? So now that we've done that, every term has an H in common, correct? So I can factor that out. That leaves me with 2X plus H minus one, because remember when you take out the full term, there's still that one placeholder there, all over h. 
What happens? They cancel. So I'm left with the limit as H approaches zero of two X plus H minus one. Now when I plug in zero, do I get zero over zero now? I actually get my rule, which is what? 2x minus 1, and then I will put my notation because you just found the derivative by evaluating the limit as h approaches 0 of the simplified form of the function. So that rule, the derivative, will help me find the gradient of any tangent line on that function or the gradient of that curve. When, when we actually evaluate it, it becomes 2x plus 0 minus 1. We can actually evaluate the limit now. So then the h is gone, and all I'm left with is 2x minus 1. There you go. So now I'm able to find the gradient of my tangent line at x equals 1. All I have to do is take the rule and do what? Plug in 1. I just evaluate the derivative when x is 1 to find the slope or the gradient of my tangent line. What's 2, mi two times 1 minus 1? So on this curve of x squared minus x plus 1, on that quadratic, when x is 1, the slope of that tangent line is equal to 1. The gradient, and I keep going back and forth with slope and gradient, so please forgive me. I should use gradient because that's the proper, notes, proper terminology. The gradient of that tangent line, the gradient of the curve at that point is equal to 1. And that's how you can incorporate old school slope, limit notation, the concept of approaching a particular value to help you find the derivative, the foundational principle of calculus.